Thank you, Mark. I'm not worried at all. The, um, so yes, as Mark says, I, my day job is at NVIDIA, but I'm here primarily presenting and representing uh, Kronos. And it's my first XTC, so I'm very happy to be able to fill in this serious omission. And I'm, I'm here with, with two um, purposes. One is to learn more about X.org and to figure out how Kronos can be a better partner to X.org. So um, I've, I've been the president of Kronos now for 18 years, uh, which is amazing because I'm only 32. <laughs> and thank you. Someone got it. Thank you. Just making sure everyone's awake. And we're going to structure this. I have a few slides. It's not technical. You'll, you'll come to realize I'm not deep technical. I work at more of the ecosystem and process level. I'll get a few, few process slides, which will hopefully be helpful um, to kick off the discussion how we might work uh, more closely together. And then I'm going to cheat for the MMA. I'm going to, we have a bunch of Kronos folks here who have a lot more detail and a lot of stuff. Um, I'm going to invite them up for the AMA. Hopefully between us we can answer uh, all your questions. So uh, if you don't know the structure of Kronos, we are an SDO, Standard Defining Organization, or Standard Development Organization. Um, we are about 150 companies. We're everyone from you know, Intel and Google, Apple, all the way down to small, single-person startup companies. We are very successfully a non-profit, and there are many SDOs out there in the industry. Each one tends to have its own focus area. Uh, our focus area is defining the interface between software and acceleration hardware. Uh, so acceleration hardware for interesting things like 3D graphics, obviously, but parallel computation, increasingly machine learning, uh, vision. Uh, really, where we our dream is to enable developers to effectively harness hardware acceleration for the good of everybody. We're committed to royalty-free um, standards. Um, and as I said, we're almost, almost 20 years old. This is the latest um, I chart on the most active initiatives that we have. Um, a big cluster around 3D graphics. And that's probably what we're best known for. Uh, we took over OpenGL uh, when the ARB uh, went under. Um, we developed OpenGL, yes, from scratch, WebGL for the web. And now, of course, we're focused mainly on Vulkan. But I wanted to, to have one side note to some of the comments earlier today. OpenGL and OpenGL, yes, are definitely not going away. I mean, if they're just past 25 years, I think they're going to be here in another 25 years. There's so much software using them. There's just no incentive for them to go away. But it is true, I think, that most forward-looking energy is now focused um, on Vulkan. Uh, we have some standards that are not APIs. We have some uh, 3D file formats. Uh, the older Collada is more in maintenance mode. A lot of energy around GLTF, which is a runtime, uh, real-time efficient 3D transmission format. We just uh, established a new working group. So new doesn't have a logo yet, 3D Commerce, which is trying to figure out how to use all this 3D stuff. to getting 3D uh, really used at industrial scale uh, in the industry. OpenXR, which I think we'll have some sessions on tomorrow for portable AR and VR. And then another cluster around compute, um, OpenCL, but also Spear, which we could talk about a little bit because that's relevant to the graphics stack as well as uh, compute. There's actually an open forum, uh, it's open to anybody, not even just members, uh, where we have a discussion forum on how we should be designing APIs for safety critical markets as things automate, as becoming increasingly important. And we have an exploratory group process. This is the new uh, topics that we haven't yet decided whether or not we want to do a working group, but we've set up a process by which the industry can come to Kronos and, and discuss whether we should do some of these things like uh, scientific visualization um, API. So as, as I go around talking to people, and I'm, I'm interested to kind of know if you guys find the same thing, there's an enormous amount of confusion between what's an open source project and what's an open standard. The, um, I think the, the industry would be helped if, they, if together we could you know, educate the folks out there um, on the differences. This is my best shot. 
I'm hoping to come away with some improvements. Um, I don't need to tell this group on the power of open source. Um, and, but I think it's the key difference between an open source organization and an open standardization organization is that the main work product from someone like x.org are implementations. You, know, you actually ship them, people use them, and they're being developed collaboratively through the open source uh, process. And a standard defining organization, our main work product is not open source, it's a specification together with conformance tests. Now we love open source, and I'm going to try and demonstrate to you how much we love open source in the next few minutes. But really the specification is aimed at a slightly different deployment scenario where you have multiple implementers and they want to be able to, you want to be able to enable multiple implementations of whatever it is to ship into the market with precisely and well tested, ideally, uh, um, functionality, no matter where that implementation comes from. I think that the standard defining organizations sometimes, well, certainly in Kronos's case, we tend to err more towards the hardware side. So a stable roadmap, a good multi company the governance model where everyone who's participating gets to have a say in how things develop because you know, the chip vendors like Intel and AMD and NVIDIA and the mobile guys, you know, we're putting a lot into this, these roadmaps. You know, we need the standard to be aligned. It's an ongoing discussion. So you know, we have um, a careful uh, governance model. We need membership dues to fund our activities. There's typically quite a lot goes into the conformance test suites. That's our biggest expense normally. And again, especially on the hardware side, there's some sensitivity around the, the, the roadmaps and some sensitivity around protecting against IP trolling. Uh, so we, d we do the development of the specs under NDA and then we get them out uh, as quickly as possible into the open. And the most important thing, of course, is that these two are synergistic. We think that the open specifications can really help open source. And again, I hope to demonstrate right now how open source is a vital tool for creating open standards. So some of the principles of organization um, now, we, we, we do think of ourselves as open. Um, we do have a membership fee, but our membership is open in the sense that any company who wants to join and is able to pay the membership fee uh, is welcome. Uh, there's no test or gate. And our uh, lowest um, fee for smaller companies is just $3,500. So we really do try to keep it accessible to the industry. The specifications we produce are open. Anyone can use them. Uh, they're royalty free. And we have a pretty good modern IP framework where essentially all the Kronos members are agreeing not to assert any of their patents against conformant implementations of Kronos specs. So we can actually turn patents for good. It's actually good if Kronos members have strong port patent folios as they participate in the IP framework, that patent portfolio turns into a protection device for these standards as they ship uh, in the industry. We have this new, new initiative process, and any member or non-member can propose new projects to Kronos. And we have like a nice process which we go through to evaluate and see which ones we want to do. So one of the outcomes maybe from today, you know, if there's ideas on stuff that Kernel should be doing, there's now a well-defined path to get that idea uh, discussed and executed, maybe, uh, inside Kronos. We're increasingly open source. Um, our specs now open source. The conformance tests are open source. Um, and we're trying to do more and more uh, in the open. But we are a nonprofit. You know, the, the fees we collect uh, go to furthering uh, our directors uh, here. And we try to focus on things, obviously, that the industry cares about. It's you know, life's too short otherwise. So the people that pay the membership dues go get to have a vote in, in the working group. Um, but again, 
participation is more important than money. We need money to keep the lights on, do what we need to do. But we're always looking for ways to make the process more accessible and more open. We have advisory panels. Uh, it's by invite. But people that are engaged in the industry and have um, the knowledge and experience to contribute to creating these specifications, please no, approach us. We would love, to, love for you to come into the advisory panels. Um, you sign up for the IP framework because you're helping to design the specs, but it's zero dollars. Um, now we've put all of the specs and conformance tests and increasingly lots of the tools and other ecosystem components uh, into open source. Of course, you know, anyone is welcome to contribute. And you know, forums and Slack channels um, open to uh, everyone. So I wanted to kind of show, I'm not sure if everyone is aware of our latest documentation specification uh, flow. Um, not all of the specs follow this, but all of the new ones do. And as we do more specs, you know, we're encouraging all of the working groups to adopt this. OpenGL and Vulkan uh, already do uh, follow this process. So all of the, the source language that we use to create the specification itself and the reference materials that go with it are now up on GitHub uh, for anyone to help us uh, fix and, and contribute to. The C it's a special CLA for the spec. It's essentially the CLA, CLA version, click-through version of the Kronos IP framework because you're contributing to the spec uh, itself. But again, all you're signing up for is if you have patents, you won't assert them against conformant implementations. And we have the spec build system, which is under Apache 2, also on GitHub. We use that for generating the canonical specs that we put on the public website. But people can also use that material. The outbound license from that process is CC BY 4. So you can, anyone can remix uh, different versions of the spec, um, different flavors, you know, different types of manuals that suits their own uh, flow. Meanwhile, we have conformance tests. A specification is not a standard unless there are associated conformance tests. Again, this is where most of our uh, money would, would disappear, creating these uh, test suites. And they're now also on GitHub. So anyone who's implementing any of these specs, you can take the spec, you can implement it, you can use the open source conformance tests and make sure it's working. The one thing, you, well, there's two things you don't get just by using everything in open source is you don't get a trademark. You can't call your thing that's half working Vulcan. Um, even if you're passing the conformance test, because we need to check uh, that you're passing the conformance test before you, we'll let you use the Vulcan logo, because the Vulcan logo has to stand for something, and you know, we need to protect our, our trademark. And you don't get the protection of the IP framework. That's to protect the IP of all the members. Members don't want to give the IP license, which is valuable to everyone doing random work. They want to give it to conformant implementation. So there has to be some definition of what conformance means. And that is where the Kronos Adopters program comes in. That gives you the process and the password to the upload folder where you can upload your conformance test results. It gets reviewed by the working group. And if it passes, you are officially conformant. And you can use the logo, because you've been tested to work. And you get the benefit of the um, license grant from 150 uh, Kronos members. There's an adopter's fee, because the adopter's fee, we need it to do those conformance tests. The good news is that for bona fide open source projects, um, Kronos is delighted to waive any adopter's fees. And actually, we've done that already for uh, Mesa and X.org. Uh, the signer, if you want to go and check the public website, is uh, spying um, uh, software and public interest. They're the legal entity that's able, that was able to sign the adopter's agreement, but it's enabled um, Mesa and X.org to participate. And you guys are adopters so far for OpenGL. OpenGL, yes. 
OpenCL, and Vulkan. Being a doctor is a first step. You actually have to submit your test results if you want those trademark and IP license uh, advantages to actually kick in. Um, so far, we have had two submissions, Vulkan 1.0 and 1.1. Um, but that's one of the things perhaps we can talk about. Where's your submission for OpenGL? Because it's free, and you know, there's lots of advantages. I wanted, I wanted to pick one of the ecosystems, particularly because we've been talking a lot about compilers today, uh, to show just how essential open source is to what Kronos is trying to achieve. Uh, Spear, Spear V, this is the intermediate representation uh, that Kronos has defined uh, for an intermediate representation that has native support for graphics and parallel uh, execution. All these pink and red boxes are open source projects. The red boxes are hosted by Kronos, and the pink ones are hosted by uh, uh, third parties. So you can see, and this kind of grows. Every time I do this presentation, there's normally one or two extra boxes. I wanted to bring your attention to a couple. DXC, if you're not familiar, this is a Microsoft-hosted uh, open source project. It's their canonical front end for HLSL. And now they can admit Sphere V. It's been largely Google working closely with Microsoft that's made that come true. So it's yeah. awesome. Now developers who want to use HLSL as well as GLSL in their Vulkan runtime uh, can compile to Vulkan uh, Sphere V. I chaired OpenCL. Um, so I'm, I'm in, into CLSPV, which is a way to compile your OpenCL C kernels and run them on a uh, Vulkan runtime because OpenCL is not available everywhere. This gives more deployment flexibility for people with OpenCL kernel um, investment. And last but not least, Spear V Cross, uh, which is a cross compiler between Spear V, Metal, HLSL, and GLSL. You can go backwards and forwards between all of the various uh, shading language uh, variants, and that is turning out to be a really key tool for layered implementations, layering one API over another. And I have a hard time keep, keeping track, so I put together this little chart. I'm sure there's projects missing, and if you know some that are missing, let me know. I would love to uh, add them. But this is the top row is the APIs being layered over uh, things down uh, the first uh, column. And I'm sure you recognize many of these uh, projects here. Many of them have been driven uh, from right, right here uh, where we stand. And, but looking at the distribution here, there's a couple of trends that, that come out. Um, Angle from Google has been you know, around for many years now doing sterling work, an immense amount of effort to enable OpenGL ES to be reliably available on many different platforms. It's been primarily driven by WebGL, but now it's getting used in other domains as well. That is now being repeated for Vulkan. Vulkan um, is the closest thing we have to an omnipresent new generation 3D API, but it's been locked out from some platforms uh, by having, from having native drivers everywhere. And this layering seems to be kind of the trend for 2019. Uh, everything being layered over everything else. So uh, Vulkan being layered over Metal is probably the best example, uh, bringing uh, Vulkan to uh, Apple platforms. Also, and this is similar to Eric's talk about Zinc uh, this morning, Vulkan is proving, I think, to be an interesting low enough level API that it becomes feasible to layer other APIs on top. Um, so for app portability and for stack uh, simplification. Kronos is doing quite a lot to, to kind of support both of these uh, trends around Vulkan. There's quite a lot of um, functionality has gone into Vulkan to enable things to be layered on top of it. Um, some of them were mentioned this morning. Um, we put in the OpenGL line extension uh, for OpenGL. Um, there's quite a little bit of new compute functionality going into Vulkan, so we can layer more OpenCL compute on top of it, and a whole list of extensions to get rid of some of the impedance mis mismatch between DX and Vulkan, so the DX APIs can uh, more smoothly lay 
over uh, the Vulcan substrate. And last but not least, layering Vulcan on other things. Um, we have an initiative in Kronos called Vulcan Portability, which is formally defining an extension that lets you take a subset that runs at native speed, you know, without going off any horrible emulation cliffs, defining that subset and having a cross-vendor extension that lets you um, interrogate, if you have a subset implementation, what um, capabilities of Vulkan are actually present. And that's being used by uh, projects like Molten VK and GFX uh, RS. And last but not least, with the deprecation from Apple, uh, you know, there's growing interest you know, to layer OpenGL and OpenCL. Um, uh, so if you're interested in that kind of uh, project, um, layering over metal, um, we'd be definitely interested to talk to you. There, I'm, I'm personally aware of a couple projects going through Molten VK, going into Vulcan, into metal through Molten VK. It's going to be interesting to see uh, whether that works out. Um, yeah, but there's a lot of interest in kind of breaking some of the fragmentation we're seeing in, in the platforms. I think this is my last slide. Just a little bit more ampl amplification because I know you guys may be working on layering, uh, the Vulcan, Vulcan Portability Initiative. Lots of people have heard of Molten VK, which is Vulcan over metal, and Luna G uh, with Karen here, they've been busy porting the SDK to Mac and they're developing um, layers. Uh, DevSim um, and emulation layers, so you can tell or not whether you're using uh, the right uh, functionality no, in your emulated uh, Vulkan. Uh, there are multi already multiple implementations, not just MontVK. Mozilla has GFXRS that's putting Vulkan over um, not just Metal, but also DirectX and OpenGL. Uh, we're close to having a portability extension uh, we're working on a conformance test suite, so anything that is present will work. Um, we're hoping to have that all kind of running, probably by next to graph. That's kind of the, the aim. So that's it. Hopefully that was a useful backgrounder. So I'd like to inv invite any willing Kronos victims <laughs> to join me up here. So we have Jason from Intel, and Karen from Luna G, and James from NVIDIA and Ian from um, Intel. So between us, uh, we should be able to answer pretty much everything. Did you guys want to briefly introduce? I know some of you have spoken already. but So um, I talked earlier today. I'm Jason Ekstrand. Um, I'm at Intel. My primary function within Kronos is as one of our representatives in the Vulkan Working Group, the Vulkan System Integration Working Group, and when I have to, the Spearview Working Group. I'm Karen Gavam, I'm Engineering Director at Lunar G, and we've been developing the Vulkan SDK and a lot of the Vulkan ecosystem tools, as well as we work on some of the other Kronos standards groups developing open source tools and software there as well. And this is my first XDC. <laughs> I'm James Jones, I work on system integration issues. Um, everything from GLX protocol back in the day through EGL and up to uh, uh, Vulkan Windows System integration and general interoperability and cross API, cross process sharing type stuff. Uh, I'm Ian Romanek. I currently work at Intel. Uh, I presented earlier. Uh, I've been participating in, well, I was OpenGL ARB. I think my first OpenGL ARB meeting was September 2001, and then when that eventually got folded into Kronos, I've been in Kronos, uh, mostly been doing OpenGL related things. Also, a lot of a lot of SpearV lately. Uh, I'm I'm also the the Kronos secretary, and I represent Intel on the the board of directors. Cool. Thank you, everyone. So, any 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 questions you can answer? Yeah. Okay, it's already on. Um, <clears throat> so for your question, how can we better work together? Um, so I've been on the board of directors for six years, and we actually spoke uh, where to uh, create this process to waive the fees for 
um, open source drivers, so yes. being able to do the conformance testing. So I'm Martin Perez. Yes. Good to meet you in fact, person. Finally. <laughs> <laughs> so I just, want, I just want to tell the room here, it's not really a question for you, but I really want to tell the room that you've been extremely supportive and uh, it's been a pleasure to work with you uh, as a you know, director of, I mean, one of the directors of Dogdor Foundation. And uh, I really understand or agree with what you were saying that you really care about the open source implementation. And whenever you were, we were talking, it made a lot of sense and it was a pleasure to work with you. So everyone, please do work with Kronos because they are amazing. Thank you. I'll, the $20 will be on its way. <laughs> 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 no, I appreciate, I appreciate you saying that. Thank you. So I've got a question for you guys. Um, first, just feedback. Um, again, I want to echo that it's, I really appreciate all the effort to, to participate with open source. Uh, it really goes a long way. Um, and then towards that end, based on some of the, uh, the sort of systems you explained, with respect to the, the trademark and patent grants and so on that exists within the Kronos organization. Um, I'm just curious about some of the semantics because with the industry, uh, companies are well organized, they're legal entities, it's very well defined, whereas open source projects are a lot more ad hoc, people come and they go, it's not always clear who the projects belong to and if they, sometimes they're forked or people have their personal trees and distributions are patching them and shipping a hundred different versions of projects. So is there any sorts of concerns with like exactly to whom these trademarks and patent grants are being given? I, I think it's okay. Don't panic. Okay. Uh, I think it's okay. The, the, the only thing we had to figure out from a legal point of view was, was someone to sign the agreement, you know, and, uh, S SPI. Is it SPI or SPI? I don't know. I don't yes. know either. Yeah. SPI. SPI you know, stepped up. They're a legal, they're, you know, a legal organization. They're, they were happy uh, to sign. And that means that you know, it's just the um, people that actually do the work, testing, and make the submissions, you know, we, we can whitelist them on. As long as you know, SPI is saying, you know, yes, they're, you know, they're representing us, and this is all good. Um, which is just an email, essentially. You know, um, we can enable uh, anyone to make those submissions. The license has been granted to the implementation, so anyone who ships that that particular implementation you know, does get the coverage from um, the IP framework. So um, I think you know, it's fairly clear. I'm not sure there's a lot of uh, ambiguity. Um, so, first disclaimer, I'm not a lawyer. Do not take anything I'm about to say as legal <laughs> advice. Okay, that said, um, one of the important aspects in the um, Kronos conformance and IP framework is there's this line about the implementation must be something like substantially similar to the original implementation. And kind of the, the I think the initial point of that was to allow people to make minor updates, make bug fixes, performance improvements, et cetera, without having to resubmit a conformance run every single time. But my non-lawyer understanding of that um, is that it also applies to distros that we package and build with a different set of build flags and that sort of thing, as long as the thing that was run when the conformance submission was submitted is basically the same thing. Now, if you, if you go out and you replace the whole compiler, um, yeah, you should probably do another conformance submission. Um, but if you're just, you know, fixing a couple of bugs and bundling it into your Debian package, I, it, again, not a lawyer, but I think that that falls under that framework. So we are covered in that sense. Cool. Thanks. Yeah. No, I, I, agree, I agree with what Jason just said. The, and if you're interested, in, no, this is of direct interest to you. Go and take a look. It's called the conformance process document. You know, snappy name. Uh, but it, it, it's all the details around how you submit you know, the tests, what you have to run. And this important point that Jason was saying is, you know, I submit one test, how much does it cover? Because you know, we don't want every time you, you, know, you make a pull request, you have to do a, a, the whole submission. We're trying to find the right balance between pragmatism and not like opening the barn door for people to drive through. Um, and that conformance process document is a living document. So you know, if you find that it doesn't, some of the wording doesn't make sense for the open source community, and it's obviously just we haven't thought about it, just let us know, and we, we can make that update. Yes? Hi, my name is Keith Packard. Um, I've actually been working with the SI group uh, for the last year or so 
on some system integration issues. Um, and I have, you, you've asked how we can work better together. Um, and what I've discovered that as I'm, I've been developing a standard in the SI framework, and it's been fantastic being able to collaborate with the other members of the SI group. But I've realized I've had to partition my work. Um, I can either collaborate with people within the SI group, within the Kronos framework, or I can collaborate with people within the within the external org organization, and I can't do both. Mm. Um, and so right now I'm working on a standard, and I'd really like to get some feedback from other people within the X org organization uh, who are not necessarily Kronos members. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd like to figure out how we can how we can make it possible for uh, upcoming standards, which may which may not have any impact on IP concerns with, of the of the Kronos members, how we can how we can do the 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 work the development work. Uh, joining the benefits of both communities somehow. Yes, and is it IP concerns that's forcing you to? No, well, it, the, the Chronos license doesn't let me uh, disclose the, the work that I'm doing within the Chronos standards community right. outside of that community. Right. And okay. I, I'd, I'd love I'd love to figure out how to fix that problem because I'd love to be able to all work together. Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, James did you, or Jason, do you? So, <laughs> it, it is a problem, and this is something that. So there's a, one particular extension that is in process, and I still cannot say when it is coming out, but it's soon. Um, this is the Timeline Summer 4 extension that last XDC I gave a presentation on. <laughs> I said soon, I didn't say when. Um, and we ran into exactly the same problem there, where we were drafting this extension, but we weren't sure, like we really needed Linux kernel support in order to get Linux kernel support, we need to go into the DRM community and be able to actually talk about things a bit more freely. Um, and the process that we did for that was unfortunately heavyweight. Um, it involved basically doing a full spec ratification only without actually releasing anything so that we could talk about it publicly. And it was uh, lots of process and very annoying. Um, so it is definitely something where we feel the pain um, and I would also like to see that improved because there's a number of places, especially anything having to do with Windows system integration, where the moment you start talking about a spec, especially if you're talking about theoretical future X or Wayland extensions, where you really want to be talking to both communities at the same time. And honestly, I don't know that we have a good answer at the moment, but it is a problem that we need to solve. So in the case, like if you said, you know, there's no IP concerns in this case, if you feel that's the case, it doesn't have to start in Kronos either. I think if you start outside of Kronos, or if the, the working group says we're not interested in taking this up here, you can do the work publicly now that we have all the infrastructure to work on, on GitHub. Um, so you can always, you can keep the whole thing public if you want to, and the working group members can still participate in that as public people. Um, it's just, yeah, yeah. So I mean, I, th I think the group, I don't know, Neil, for sure, but they can still say we're not interested in covering the IP of this and just release it back to the public. Um, uh, I don't know if that's, that's going to be a case-by-case -case basis. It's probably hard to do in practice. But if you start public, it's much easier to just stay public, I think. Yeah, I think for this case, that's probably a better way to do it. Uh, maybe for some other cases, like, like the one that, that Jason was talking about, that might be a place where something like the advisory panels could be used, but not that exactly, because I think of that's still maybe too too heavyweight and, re and restrictive. But it, yeah, some some. Something that looks kind of like that, I think, might be might be possible. So another possibility, um, and again, unfortunately, the situation things are in is it got started within the working group under the IP framework, and so now it can never leave until it gets ratified, or, or we decide to ship it without ratification. But another thing that we can probably do better at is we do occasionally have IP-free discussions as part of working group meetings. And as long as we are good about very specifically segregating so that the people who um, can't legally participate in that because of the company's rules can just mute their microphone. Um, we can theoretically do that. We just need to make sure that we're very clear about these things that are being discussed don't fall under the IP framework and yada, yada, yada. Um, and that's not something we do a lot of currently, but it's, I think, something that we could do more of. And I think, especially in the Windows system integration, it might be a good idea to do more of it. I think that's an awesome idea, because it, it, it's, it is a problem, and it's not just between these two organizations, any organization, because you know, obviously you have to be respectful for people's IP that's being contributed. That goes, you know, that's a given. And so you have one organization that has 150 companies sort of 
contributed to a spec you know, with one expected purpose, and it's going to be a Kronos certified spec under the IP framework. And another organization has another whole bunch of members with a different expectation. And then you say, OK, now we're going to munch it all together. It becomes, it becomes tricky. The, the, the working groups can um, talk publicly, to Jason's point, pretty much about everything. The red line that we have is we don't um, circulate the actual draft specification language, because that is like catnip to patent trolls. Um, but everything else up to that line, we can talk about. And so you know, if we can have meaningful discussions, you know, being careful not to cross that line. Yeah, yeah, you know, we should. And, and it's quite common, obviously, for organizations for things like this to have a liaison. We can have a liaison agreement saying, let's meet every three months. Let's talk about these topics, and let's be careful in these ways, and then we can, we can make a workable framework. Yep, go ahead. Um, so to so the uh, Vulcan portability effort, um, do you, I, I looked at the code. I didn't see it, anything immediately. Is there a way, reasonably, to get that extension with all the limitations that implies on a Linux machine. Like if I want to target that, but I still want to develop against my Mesa or my NVIDIA Vulkan implementation, can I get that as a layer? So what are you laying on, layering on? on Vulkan on Vulkan. Like it would, be, Vulcan it, Vulcan. it would be a layer that simply advertises VK, XDEX, portability subset, yes. and then turns off a bunch of features. Yes, you could. It's just not available, so you'd have to do it. But okay. yes, there will be no barrier to you doing that. There was, there was a lot of discussion inside the working group because the working group rightly was very concerned about not letting this be you know, a trapdoor where people that can't be conformant suddenly can turn off a bunch of stuff. And, right. but so, um, and the conformance process document, which we're just putting the final finishing touches on for Vulcan portability, mm -hmm. um, tries to set some nice safeguards so you warrant it is a layered implementation and stuff like that. So if it is a layered implementation, um, there will be no barrier okay. to to using it, right? Oh, and just, just thinking as that makes it something that it makes it possible to target on your own machine. With, if your native development environment isn't an Apple, right. then you can say, oh well, I can build this, and I know this is going to work. I have some reasonable assurance that it would work if I once I rebuild it somewhere right. else. Right, and we're we're just about to start putting the effort into the conformance test, so it will key off that same extension, so it won't fail on the stuff that's advertised as missing. Yeah. So. Cool. And you get to use a slightly different logo. You get to use the Vulcan portability logo. And you have to give me $20. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Go ahead. Hi. So I've uh, actually worked on a Mesa OpenGL ES implementation that I tried to submit for conformance. Um, in that process, I found something surprising. Um, when there were conformance test suite bugs in the published open source conformance test suite compared to the published open specs, if I try and submit bug fixes to the GitHub repository, um, they will get closed because I'm a Kronos member. And apparently, the process is that changes to the CTS by <laughs> Kronos members have to be done through the closed GitLab. So now I can't refer to the discussion about this CTS from our open source project because the people that might need to read that discussion might not have Kronos member access to I the think GitHub repositories. I think that's a mistake. Yeah. I think there's an issue in the process. Okay, come, on. I mean, does anyone know more details? It wasn't. Was there a reason for that? That doesn't sound right. Uh, I, I don't know. I don't really know what the reason My, is, but I know that it is factored. Uh, my uh, my recollection from back when we were doing Vulcan 1.0 and things weren't released yet was that there were certain. Companies that were involved that did not want anything, they any of their involvement apart from like if one of their people wrote tests, the you know commit message didn't want any other involvement from them to be public, and so there was a process that was set up wherein anything that needed sort of IHV sign off would go through the private channels because otherwise some of these companies were very scared to participate. I I think I have heard rumors that some of those companies are a little less scared now, so maybe it could be changed. And I think it would be awesome to see it changed because 
the fact, well, the fact that it uses Git is terrible, but the fact that it's closed is also terrible. Um, and that's one major hole in terms of Kronos open source process where we don't do a real good job. And so, yes, that, that should be fixed if we can. Yes, thank you for raising that. I didn't know that. Oh, I, at least I've wiped it out, so we can we can fix that. You, you know what? You know the details. So we can figure it out later, right? I kind of roughly. Yeah. Okay. Or or send us an email. Send us an email. Okay. Any other questions? How are we doing on time? We're almost. Yeah, a couple more minutes. Go so you were asking where are the other submissions for the free uh, conformance submissions? Uh, the answer is they're stuck in limbo. Okay. So uh, I'm <laughs> one of the developers of the open source Edna with graphics drivers for the Vivante GPUs, and we've tried to arrange uh, a conformance submission through the XORG Foundation and. From my recollection, which is a bit hazy because it's yeah, quite a while ago when we tried to do this, uh, someone from the XORG board sent some emails to Kronos and never got an answer if it's okay for us to submit or not. Okay. And uh, to be totally honest, I didn't really push anymore because it's n not really that interesting for us, <laughs> to be honest, but, but yeah. <laughs> Okay. Well, uh, thank you for raising it. I'm sorry we, we miss, missed an email, but the, um, the buy me a beer and we'll figure it out. I mean, it's it, it's it's important that we do. I I, I want the Mesa OpenGL to have the protection of the IP framework and to be you know, used to trademark and everything, and hopefully we can you know, do it without too much busy work. So let's uh, yeah let's unlock jam that one. Yeah. yeah. So that's one thing where we probably could do better. <laughs> yeah, obviously, yeah. But it's good. No, thank you for raising it. And th these will, yeah, these trivial problems, well, maybe trivial problems. No, e now you know who to email. You can email any of us. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right, James? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, just one more. To that point, yeah. Yeah. Um, so Adam Jackson, Red Hat. Uh, one of the things that we've had some trouble with with the, the conformance process and the reason why we haven't submitted any so far is that as far as our my, my understanding is that the thing you're certifying is a very particular combination of driver build and hardware. Yes. So I have, I have two problems with that. One is that I have zero control over which video card my, my people, people right. install my operating system on. Right. And secondly, there are situations where I don't have a video card at all. Right. I have only LLVM pipe. I have a software renderer, which can now, am I, what, what's my validation there? Am I validating that this works on an Ivy Bridge? Am I validating that this works on a Ryzen? Right. Am I on a Power 9? Like that testing matrix starts to become really large. So procedurally, it's difficult for me to know what I can certify. And with that, and like, you know, if Xorg wants to submit certification results that says, yeah, we tried this on a bunch of Radeons, it's probably okay. Right. I don't know if that's going to be sufficient if for the for patent was like. And yeah. these are these are lawyery questions, but so for something like LLVM pipe, what you'd be certifying it on is a particular in, in that case, the way that it's it's phrased is that you would be certifying it on a particular uh, CPU architecture. So Technically, you'd probably have to do one for x86-64, PowerPC-64, you know, whatever kind of CPU architectures that you operate on, because that's that's the main thing that affects whether or not it's actually going to work. Mm -hmm. For GPUs, what's what's supposed to happen, and like what what Intel does is we do submissions for each each version, uh, each API version that Mesa supports on each chipset that we make, and so we kind of go through and check those boxes, and as long as what you're shipping is, you know, like Jason was saying, substantially the same as the thing that we submitted conformance on, then it would be just like, I mean, it's yeah. no different than like NVIDIA, when they have new driver versions, they don't resubmit conformance for a particular piece of hardware. It's just mm. an update to the software, and it's, the, the agreement is they didn't break anything. Right. Um, so, but you do, like, if you submit for when you got a new, a new chipset coming out, you do that at the family level, not at the SKU level. 
Like you don't test Ivy Bridge two by eight and three by eight differently. Right. Right. Because they're they're substantially the same. Okay. Um, but if we do have like you know, when there's a case where we have uh, a particular GPU family and there's the full desktop version and then the the modified version that's with an Atom CPU, we we do those separately because because they're not really the same. Right. Um, but when it's when it's you know we're gonna emit the same GPU code and has the same set of features and you know run right. down the line where it's just kind of the number of execution units that changes like it's it's the same. Okay. Because I've been I've been trying to follow along with like the submission results as you see them come by on the mailing list and you can see yeah okay you it looks like you've got one for kind of every new ASIC and that seems so, that's, I can't do that. Sorry, when we do a submission like that, what, what we list is, there's, there's two things that are listed in the submission. One is, this is the thing we actually ran the tests on, and here's the list of things that we're asserting are basically the same. And so okay. it'll be, we tested on a particular Skylake, mm -hmm. and here's all the other Skylakes that are, you know, that are the same. Okay, you know, that's actually that's same. that's really good to hear because I think that'd be something that we could get close a lot closer to working. Yeah, with. a really sort of rough and ready way of thinking about it, and this isn't precise, but like if you were to build a CI system, you are going to have one of this, one of this, one of this, one of this. That set of things is what you should submit on. Okay, like if you're reasonably confident that a change is if it, if a change breaks Ryzen, it's also going to break Ivy Bridge. Then you only need one. Okay, that makes sense. Thank you. That's a good question. We, we, we are trying to find the right balance between actually the conformance testing meaning something and not making it totally impossible for people to be conformant. So if you have, and again, I think the open source ecosystem could well be different in subtle ways that you know, we may have inadvertently put stuff in there that doesn't quite suit how your stuff flows through your distribution channel. Come and talk to us more, and then we can figure that out. So one very concrete example of that is Looking on, again, the timeline, some of our stuff, Lionel counted up and we now have six semaphore implementations in our driver, depending on your kernel version and depending on some other things. We do not intend to run some conformance on four kernels for every single driver. <laughs> we're, gonna, we're going to do due diligence to make sure that it doesn't break on all the kernels, but the, the, there are always going to be changes. And we've got other stuff we turn features on and off in the GL drivers based on kernel versions and various other things. And it's, it's kind of a trust thing of, you know, you, you've said that if this thing works, then this whole family works, then it's, we kind of trust you to do that, but yeah. Yeah, the magic phrase is, of course, there's nothing previously working to break, so there's a pretty big catch-all. Okay, I think we're out of time. Mark, are we out of time? One more? Okay. Oh, this one's easy. It's uh, less of a question, more of feedback. So, um... As uh, somebody who's not really have an affiliation and who recently waded into Kronos to try and start uh, establishing a new extension for Vulkan, mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to express that uh, I really appreciate the, 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 the intention of collaborating more closely with the open source community, but the messaging on the website could use improvements. Um, as I was trying to figure out how do I submit an extension to Vulkan, um, yes. All the resources I could find were industry focused, and were like, you pay a thousand or six thousand dollars to submit an extension yeah, to Vulcan. Yes. Well, you, uh, don't, pay I only, I, you I, don't pay per extension, but yes, I totally sure, take your sure. point. Yes. But I only ever found out that you could do it through GitHub by word of mouth, so there could be improvements in the messaging. Yes, yes I agree. Cool. That's good feedback too. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, as you say, no, this is a pretty recent thing, and it was one of the things you really focused on when we were bringing up this whole new, like, specification ecosystem for Vulcan. We really wanted to make it possible for people from the open source community, for someone who's not in Kronos, who had an idea, um, to submit that as an extension just like a member could. So we put a lot of work into that. But the messaging probably hasn't trickled out yet. Um, but I'm sure it should be improved. Okay, I think we really are out of time. Now to questions. So, okay, thank you, everyone.